I love that vacant stare <laughs> that sort of live news reporters have when they're waiting to get the sort of cue in their ear to tell them that they are live. But I believe we actually are live. So hello and welcome to the Run Testers Different Gear, your new monthly update from inside the world of running gear and tech brought to you in partnership with so running. My name is Danny Easton. I'm the host of the Big Run podcast. And no, we're not doing a microphone review here. We're also <laughs> recording a podcast simultaneously that will be coming out a week today. We'll be doing a slightly deeper dive of today's episode. We are live at Saw HQ. We are inside the basement that's affectionately called the lab where they do a lot of product testing and design. And uh, Sora are powering this episode. And they've also given us a wind, uh, the, the, the all weather, the all weather. weather. <laughs> there's a lot of jackets they do. It's the all weather 3.0, which is the, the latest iteration of Saw's kind of top tier jacket designed for the nastiest conditions as well. So we'll, we'll be giving you details about how to win that later, later on in the show. Make sure to hit subscribe, turn on the notifications because the subscriptions help with, with Nick's headband sort of collection. collection. That, that's, that's, what I've been, that's what I've been told. And like I said, this is also live. So hopefully there should be a comment section at the bottom of your screen as well. So if you have any questions about any of the stuff we're going to be talking about today, pop it in there and Tom will be the man on the on the questions. And we'll, we'll dive into them <laughs> later. Try. He's going to try. So uh, guys, uh, how, how's it going? Like how are the legs? There's been a lot of marathons running the past couple of days. We've done a few, I think. He's I've, done the most. I've yeah. done the most. <laughs> so I, I'm fresh off with seven marathons in seven days. To test the battery life for the Vertix 2, mm -hmm. I'm pretty knackered, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> evidence of that is went to bed at half past six on Friday night, woke up at eight o'clock, slept straight through. Lovely. Nice. nice. Yeah. Berlin for you, wasn't it, Mike? Berlin for me. Before. So that was a couple of weeks ago. I only ran one marathon um, and then ate a lot of schnitzel afterwards. So, uh, But yeah, it was great. I um, got a nice kind of big PB for me for my marathon and I've just kind of been recovering since then and now I'm kind of ready to kind of focus on next year and going a little bit quicker really. Well speaking of quick marathons, <laughs> the sort of quickest marathon out of all of us and Nick yeah. you, you got pretty well in London as well didn't you? Yeah, London, London was solid. Uh, I had a little bit of a blow up in the last bit. I ran a 2.33. It's my fastest London. But what I really want to talk about is the New Forest 5K. Now, this is the UK's premier running event, and I managed to seal the win there. <laughs> Another one where you took the tape. Yeah. Took the tape yeah. of that. Didn't win London, so it's basically gone in my mind. What did you win? Uh, I won a Garmin. and I, was, <laughs> I love watches, so... <laughs> Did you have to do your best kind of enthused face, even though you probably come across Luckily, like multiple watches all the time? It's all sent in the post afterwards. Right, and I also okay. got entry to next year's New Forest 5K, so, <laughs> which is the UK's premier running event. So it's <laughs> nice to be back. Nice to be going back as, as, as reigning champ. Uh, uh, Tom, you were at London as well. How'd you go? I was in London. Yeah, I did really well, actually. I was, um, I've not really been training on recently. I've, I've kind of just been on holiday for a lot. So... Um, yeah, I wasn't expecting a lot. I thought, you know, just going to enjoy it. Hope My aim was basically to beat Kieran first and hopefully beat him after six consecutive marathons. And then when I realised I was beating him, my next uh, goal was to... Just picking off the run test. <laughs> <laughs> there's only a limit. There's a limit. So yeah, I could, yeah, I could, yeah, I could yeah. test this. But uh, they went really well, although I am injured now. So it was a uh, PB. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. So what's what's been sort of grabbing the headlines over the past couple of weeks? Like what's been sort of in the news? Like I know... like. It seems to always be a point of conversation is carbon shoes. Like oh, yes. it's sort of as angrily debated in many a sort of running WhatsApp group. But like, I know Kieran, you wrote something recently for, for Wired, which is kind of saying that maybe we shouldn't get that obsessed with the carbon. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I covered a really interesting study out of uh, the Stephen F. Austin State University. Uh, the lead researcher is Dustin Juba on that. And he basically put a couple, some 12 runners on a treadmill in different carbon shoes. There were seven shoes that they tested mm -hmm. and they were looking at their kind of running economy and which of the carbon shoes really made that much of a difference. So very quickly, I'm going to run through the shoes that they tested. So we had the Nike Alpha Fly, the Nike Vaporfly 2, the Socony Endorphin Pro, the, Ho the Hoka Rocket X, the Asics Metaspeed Sky, New Balance RC Elite, the Brooks Hyperion Elite 2, and the eighth shoe was a non-carbon shoe for comparison, which was the Asics Hyperspeed. Right. Now, the long and short of this is Basically, only three shoes were really shown to make a significant difference. Those shoes were, surprise, surprise, the Vaporfly, the Alpha Fly, <laughs> and then the one that snuck in there was the Asics Metaspeed Sky. The other shoes had, a, you know, we're looking at sort of like a 1.5%, somewhere around there, uh, enhancement on your running economy. So really the study kind of flagged up that some of these shoes that you might be spending £200 plus on aren't making that much of a difference mm. to you. 
It's all about the phone. We're saying this phone. There was another study reference in that, which was really interesting, was where they cut the carbon plate in half on the vapor fly and found it improved efficiency just as much. Often the plate just stabilizes these amazing foams, I think. So um, I know that there was a lot of criticism originally about the fact that he didn't have the Adios Pro. And this guy was like working with what he had. Like he, I think it's quite a big foot size as well he was working to. So yeah. he couldn't get hold of the Adios Pro or Pro 2. Subsequently, he's tested the Adios Pro 2. Everyone was very excited, you know, the big Nike Adidas showdown. And he, but he's only tested it on himself. He couldn't get all 12 runners in for that. And he found that it, it didn't really, it wasn't up to the standard of the two Nikes, the Adios or even the Asics. I think a lot of it will come down to the foam material used. Nike Famous uses a PIVA-based foam, but we don't necessarily know what everyone else is using. Yeah, and I think it's really important to say in that study, I mean, he's literally had to go and sort of try and get these shoes. So he wasn't working with any of the companies. Yeah. It was, oh, okay, so it's all off his own back. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, was, yeah. it was off of kind of a small amount of funding as well. So it was a really interesting study. It was just something that he was sort of interested in. And I guess, you know, the report actually came out, and there's a quote from the report which says, it is evident from our data that simply including a carbon plate or increasing the snap height in a racing shoe does not confer equal improvements in economy. And it says that this would suggest that the foam and or the interaction of the foam and the plate is crucial to the economy benefits. Mm -hmm. So it's really that combination of both. And it's maybe why we kind of see that a lot of the companies guard very closely their secret source of what's in the foam. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to necessarily find out whether it's a PIBA or what. You know, they don't, yeah. you know, particularly sort of light strike Pro, we're still, some, still trying to work out what's actually <laughs> yes. going in there. Um, and that leaves a little bit of wiggle room for people to, I guess, go out and run and have a sensation that they can... Is That's a, all personal is a, experience, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, subjective rather than objective. Yeah, but those stack heights do... They're getting higher and higher and higher. <laughs> it's like getting to the point now where they're, well, certain shoes have become illegal and they're making athletes get disqualified from races. Like in Vienna recently, an athlete had his, his yeah, win taken away uh, from him. Exactly, yeah, that was uh, Dorara Harissa. He ran in the Prime X. I think I saw somewhere that he'd registered a different shoe he was going to run in, a legal shoe, then ran in the Prime X, got spotted Sneaky. and disqualified. And... Yeah, so the Primax is a 50 millimeter stack and it also breaks the rules. So the, the legal limit is 40 uh, in a certain size. I think it's a US size 8.5. Mm -hmm. um, but he also, but it also has two sets of kind of stiffening rods in it, the kind of Wolverine claws that Adidas puts in its shoes. Um, and that's also not allowed. And he ran the shoe and got disqualified afterwards. And, it, you know, there's a bit of debate here. He actually didn't run incredibly fast. He ran a 209, which isn't his PB, which is 208. Um, you know, it's, it's still fast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not, yeah. Not, yeah. But um, basically the problem is, like, you know, he's going to get caught. But what mm. about people further down the chain? And this has been marketed as a bit of a racing shoe. I don't think it's like, if it's, you know, I'm not, anywhere near an elite, but there's people in my kind of bracket who might be tipped almost if the shoe was significantly better. If someone goes from a 222 to a 218 runner, suddenly they are in line for getting deals and stuff like that. You know, where do you draw the line? Where are people allowed to use these shoes? Mm -hmm. And then other brands are starting to follow suit, but pitching them more as training shoes. I've seen, I've seen a New Balance one that looks like it's going to come out as a 50 mil stack. And it's just like, I just feel as if there's a limit, it's a limit for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're elite. It doesn't matter if you're out to set a world record. You're still racing against your peers and yourself. And on, on that note, going back to the study, I think one of the really interesting things is that the study was done on people who are quite fast runners. So they were all doing or capable of doing a sub uh, 1735k. They'd done it in the recent, in the previous kind of year, I think. And so they were, you know, they were maintaining kind of a high pace. But this study is going to start to look at runners who are moving at kind of slower paces. So hopefully at some point we'll get a, a, an answer to that question about how carbon shoes and those phones mm. work out kind of in the in the kind of more wider population and sort of more general running community. Mm. I also yeah. worry as well, as the stack heights get higher, like the, the sort of trickle down effect for sort of maybe not quite elite runners like myself, like what it does to your form and, and, and your feet mm. as well and like the potentials for like for injuries. But that that can also be measured as well. Like you can sort of take in your form. Like you've been looking at a lot of tech, haven't you, Mike, to kind of analyse that. Could you, could you put on those offending shoes and see whether <laughs> they're sort of doing you any damage or not? I mean, yeah, there's definitely there's definitely a big trend uh, in tech at the moment, and generally focus around running uh, about devices that can prom or promise to kind of look at your form, look at your technique, maybe mm -hmm. even stop you from getting injured or prevent injury. Um, now, what I'm seeing, and obviously I'm still doing a lot of this testing, is that there's a consistency in terms of what these devices are promising, how much they cost. They're very expensive, um, but what I'm seeing straight away is they're ultimately falling at the first hurdle for me and that is just being really easy to set up and use mm. you know I we can all go out uh, have our watch on start tracking our runs a lot of these things are quite clunky and quite <laughs> difficult to put you know kind of put on and straight away that's putting you know, for me putting me in the wrong mindset of whether I want to use these things and I think that's a real a real challenge for, and also and I think we agree the information where that information is coming from and how that information is going to be interpreted by the average person who's paying 200 
250 pounds plus right. for these devices yeah mm. and there's a lot of information it's often geared and these devices are marketed often as things that can prevent injury you know mm. which runner you know that's danny you don't you don't if i said to you 250 <laughs> quid to not get injured or to you know reduce your injuries it's, 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 it's a, a tempting offer like, it is everyone yes. wants that but actually in practice you know applying the information that it gives you a lot of it is quite detailed kind of sports kind of science really and biomechanics that's going on in these devices and actually, I just think they overpromise and under-deliver. Mm. Not only are they sort of complicated in terms of form factor, but in terms of deciphering what you're being told, it's kind of interruptive, and I don't believe it does more than a coach. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I'm I'm a big form skeptic for the average person until you're getting injured or worried, especially if you're like a marathon runner. I think there's so many so many different variations in form and mm. the very top end of running that I think it's something that most runners it's a bit of red heading herring red heading red herring for most runners <laughs> and i think that you know you spend a lot better time focusing on your training your eating your sleeping compared to worrying about you know your exact running form so these devices i think actually fail at that hurdle for me which is mm. is this of any use even if it worked perfectly and mm. i don't think it really is and if you were going to spend 250 pounds on it i'd go and see a real human who can actually look at you and talk to you about all those other things and how they interplay yeah. with your running. All those qualified medical professionals, physiotherapists, yeah, exactly. sociopaths. It's like you're going up against that world. Well, <laughs> it's another disjoint in the two because obviously we can get a lot more data now. We can get a lot more information on what mm. we're doing, which is great. But we did something with Shane Benzie a while ago where he uses that information with the head of a coach to then adapt it and use it for your... So he looks at your running, then takes the data in as well and gives you feedback from mm. that. But if you're just getting loads of data as a normal person you can't understand it really. You don't need that much data. Mm. So I think you need somebody now, maybe in the future, in 10 years time, it will be at the point where it gives you the right, what you should be doing. But at the moment, it just seems to be, there's a big disparity between what we're getting told. And we haven't even touched on accuracy, by the way. Mm. That's, yeah. a whole, that's, that's a whole other ball game of those things as <laughs> that's, well. That's, that's, that's for a whole other yeah. episode. <laughs> deep dive. So what, what, are you, what are you getting excited about? Why are you not being skeptical about the moment? What's sort of like creating a bit of buzz in the run testers at the moment? Well, I've been using... Super yeah, Sapiens. I'm on that trade as so well. So I've used this for a while. It's been around for a while. Uh, basically, a real-time blood glucose monitor that is it's kind of di- it's technology that was used for type 1 diabetics initially. So it's life-saving tech. And it's been kind of brought into the normal kind of lifestyle and kind of performance sort of arena for non-diabetics. Mm. And what it's essentially doing for you in that environment is to sort of tell you a couple of things. It can help you work out how to fuel ahead of your runs, but also then during real-time It'll tell you whether or not your fueling is optimum for, say, a marathon or whatever you're doing in, in training. Now, I just use this for the seven in seven, and there are, there are a couple of things actually. It's you know the real time data you can sync it now to a Garmin IQ field and add, have that on your Garmin watch. Most of the Garmin watches will carry it, and also Super Sapiens have launched their own band that puts that blood glucose number on your wrist. Mm. Okay. So idea being here that you can run a marathon, see that your your levels might be dropping, the trend will be going down, and that it's below your glucose time performance. Your gel, yeah. <laughs> time to yeah. mm. A couple of problems here I've found. One is that it drops out quite a lot, and that's, you know, you have to have the app open all the time for it to sync with the Garmin Connect at the moment, and also the sensors have dropped out quite a lot when you run. It's something to do with just when you get moving. Uh, I spoke to Super Sapiens, and they, they told me that that was the known problem with Abbott and the sensors. So there's a few issues here, but some really interesting information one good example of how I think this is really useful, if you whack one of these on, wear it for a couple of weeks and test the food that you're going to eat before running. I used to eat porridge. Used to get, I used to feel kind of sort of hollow and hungry again an hour later, but everyone tells you porridge should keep you satiated for hours. But for me, I can now see with this, I've got a big spike and a big crash. And so that porridge isn't my ideal food to eat mm. before I go for a run. So you can unlock some data outside of the run as well. Mm, really zero in on kind of what works mm. sort of specifically for you. Yeah, and you've got to do a bit of science on yourself. So it is a bit involved. It, it, the, the app is very sort of detailed, yeah. confusing. Very comprehensive. <laughs> yeah. Comprehensive, confusing <laughs> um, a little bit. But if you can you can dig in and pull out some of the little bits of detail and do some experimenting on yourself, mm. then you can unearth some interesting facts. Mm. And that would be for me, I think, as well, having experience using it, I think, you know, Nick, has tried it as well as I think I don't think it's for everyone but I do think there there are runners there are types of people that it will if you can understand and interpret the information then it's brilliant it wasn't for me I think probably it was a little bit more kind of intense for me in terms of the delivery information but I think there is potential in in this space and it growing for for endurance sports and for, for running and for athletes I think the live thing is massive I think yeah. that made a huge I, I actually had a problem wearing it. I found that two of the three I tried I had to take off they were hurting too much I thought I'd, I'd applied them the same way as the one that was fine for two weeks, but ended up 
niggling me. I have absolutely no upper body muscle. That could have been a problem. I don't <laughs> know. Yeah. 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 It was a needle this big. It actually came out the other side of my arm. It was yeah. really weird. <laughs> but um, yeah, I found that a bit of a And I used it for a few runs to see how different gels affected my body. And then I more or less lost interest. So I think that's the problem I had. <laughs> the other interesting I used it in every day of the seven in seven. It told me I was below my glucose performance zone. Yeah. And I ate gels and I didn't feel under fuel personally mm -hmm. but the other thing to say i think is at the moment it's quite expensive so you're looking at two sensors around 150 euros each sensor lasts a fortnight so do the sums and to wear this for a year you're talking about a lot of cash yeah. it's, it's, it's the kind of thing you'd want to learn your stuff and then not use it again yeah. or probably yeah. then but then you lose that live reading yeah. which i think is very important and i think as well having it having the band as well on your arm is like yet another thing to be wearing <laughs> there's already so many swap, smart watches out there like polo have just jumped in and launched two more right only recently uh, yeah, well, updates to the existing one. So the Polar Grit X came out here last year, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and now they've just released the Polar Grit X Pro. Mm -hmm. um, with tongue twister. <laughs> I've been trying to research this, and I've got lots of information on it, and I keep getting it wrong. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, the Polar Grit X Pro, it's largely an update to the sort of build of the watch. It's got a, a, a sapphire glass instead of grid glass. It's basically designed to be a lot more durable. So that's the kind of focus of this watch. But there are a few features that updated in it um, around dashboards. And I'm not going to go through the details now because we'll be doing a full review of this at some point in the future. Yeah. Um, but then there's also the Polar Grit X Pro Titan, which has a titanium build on it, which is a lot more expensive. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, – and I think there's also a number of uh, each updates coming or firmware updates coming to uh, the – Vantage V2 and some of the other watches in their yeah. Cortex as well. They've basically yeah. kind of, they've upgraded the top of the flagship watches mm -hmm. and they're both much more, they've actually got very similar feature sets across them, but the Grit X Pro is this kind of chunky outdoorsy looking watch for those mm -hmm. adventurous types, whereas mm -hmm. the sleek advantage is what I'd have myself. Yeah, so the prices, Tom, so we're talking for the for the Pro Titanium. Pro Titanium is £519. And yeah. the Pro? 430 uh, yeah, the Pro is 430 yeah. Yeah. They're still, so the I don't know, they're, they're cheaper than sort of high-end Garmin's and the high-end sort of Coros. But for me, it's like this battery life is still 40 hours. I, I'm not, yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to testing it, but on paper and on the announcement, I'm a little bit worried about this because I just, I'm not sure it's done enough to jump on. My first thought is why haven't these updates come straight down to the Polar Grit X? Yeah, this would have been a fantastic update to the Grit X, which mm. at 370 odd would have been a fantastic yeah. value. And it would have been real like, you got to watch last year, good news. Here's a load. I mean, they're bringing a lot of those features to the Grit X. Mm. Not all of them, but most of them. But then it just, yeah, it's one of our big things is I, will, I would happily pay £10 for a very good software update to a watch mm. I had rather than lose out. And it should stuff. be clear that we all quite liked the original Polar yeah, Grit X. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for a lot of people, it's when you buy a smartwatch, it's a big commitment and you you want to get something that you think is going to last for a long period of time. Yeah, yeah, so you don't yeah, want to feel yeah. like it's just been replaced the following year. Yeah. Well, we're, we're all sat here ready to be loyal subscribers to a particular brand for the first person who comes out and provided the hardware can take it, yeah. offer us the updates for a, a nominal price, you know, an extra price, an incremental fee. Well, I, I think people will do that because yeah. sustainability is a huge thing. I think, you know, we all talk about sustainability in shoes and clothes. The tech companies who make the watches get away scot-free as far as I'm concerned. We're no one yeah. kind of questioning it. And this would be a great way to build loyalty and be more sustainable. It used mind. to be the thing. Like, like the olden days when you got a your Windows to XP, mm -hmm. you bought the new Windows, like you got as an upgrade, like, and then it just, all the software this goes is going the wrong way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 point is people used to go, oh, I'm getting new features on my existing software. I'll pay for that. And now it's just like, it's a software update. It should be free. And actually, then you end up going, well, then we can't, we can't make money on it. So we're going to release a new watch. And it's, yeah. it's a bit of both sides, maybe. Yeah, it's always better when things are sort of refined, I think, and sort yeah. of there's like slight iteration. I tell you who are very good at that is the people at Saw. And they have actually given <laughs> us their latest jacket to give away. And I know, Nick, you've had a bit of time with the, the previous iteration. Oh, yeah. Just sort of talk us through this uh, Hold your weather jacket 3.0 that you can sort of see there yeah. in the foreground. So 2.0 has been my winter jacket for the last two winters. So mm -hmm. the new one has like slightly lighter materials, and even better fit, that kind of like refinements to what was... My favourite running jacket. Like last two winters in the UK, uh, those who can't remember, one I can tell you very clearly because I was marathon training in both. One was very very cold and there was a bit of snow, and then last one was very very wet. And I wore that jacket for both those winters every single day, pretty much, because um, it's the main thing I like about it is for me is I, you know if it's cold I'm still going to go out and do my sessions and it's very tight fitting, it doesn't slow you down in any way. So I found that 
I hold both winters. Didn't it was it was sub zero sometimes. You know, we're not talking Canada here. It's uh, the UK. So you know, but it was either you know twelve degrees, mild but wet, or like sub five, same jacket, one base layer every time. Never changed my layering system, mm. and um, yeah, I really like it. So the new one, you know, it's uh, it's pretty exciting to see the new one coming out, and that's a good, very good prize yeah, for a virtual. I think it's <laughs> really really good. We've just had had a little bit of time being sort of tactile with it now. The sort of the construction and the fabric look fantastic. So. If you do want to get your hands on this jacket, if you head over to sawrunning.com forward slash different gear, all the details about how to enter the competition will be on there and we'll be announcing the winner in next month's show. And you can get one of those jackets. It's amazing. So <laughs> in terms of testing at the moment then, so what are you guys, what are you guys working on at the moment? What's sort of in the, in the, in the run testers lab at the moment? What's sort of, what's been put through its paces? You mentioned the seven in seven challenge yeah, there. Maybe, maybe it's worth giving a bit of context about what that actually was. Um, I'm never not going to talk about this now. It's my new MDS. It's the new marathon to start. I did things. So I, I basically ran seven marathons in seven days. And the idea being that this Corus Vertex 2 is 140-hour GPS battery life. And I wanted to see how that stacked up. So I thought, actually, how better to test it? Stick it in lots of GPS modes and do a really kind of thorough test to see. It's got four or five um, GPS settings and see day-to-day how much battery burn I got, how much battery burn overnight when I was kind of sleeping in between as well. Mm-hmm. So I went around seven and seven and finished it up at London. And I can say that, I mean, I, I was the watch only died this morning. So it was two weeks and five hours, 189 miles. I did 30 and a half hours of GPS running with optical heart rate running. And one of those was had a run which had three hours of music. Mm-hmm. Right. music talk us through the music <laughs> yeah. so, so last time we, talk, we talked about your love of EDM <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but Danny I couldn't get EDM on this basically I only had I, I realised that when I went out in the morning I had three tracks on this no, I had six tracks three of them were the ones that come on this which are like stock music the other one was um, <laughs> was there's no easy way out <laughs> from, Very from Rocky yeah, yeah. and the other one was lucky man by the verb so I, I had those on loop kid you not for three hours it worked a treat. This is a thing I'm going to use again. Those two songs, Cracking, kept me going. I, wouldn't, I mean, don't... Wait, do you still hear them when you fall asleep at night? I know the words. Still... I could sing you them now. Did you pick the song titles just purely based on irony? <laughs> <laughs> just seven marathons with the same three songs. No, just one marathon okay, with the music right. on. <laughs> well, that's not... Well, it's still quite bad. <laughs> let, let me hear your sort of other stats. So in full GPS, it only burnt 2% for a four and a half hour marathon. In all systems, G- in all systems, yeah, next level, next yeah. level is 5%, and that will scale up to around the 90 hours, which is kind of what it's listed as. Yeah. All systems plus dual frequency, which is this kind of hyper-accurate mode, uh, it only burnt 7%. So that's like the top-end burn rate. When I had the music on, uh, I, I only lost 17% music plus dual frequency. So we're talking, you know, the performance of this is, is absolutely cracking. Overnight, it was burning 1%, yeah. and it was like 2 to 3% between runs for general use i mean it's a big hulking great watch but that battery life is not messing around kieran loves battery life we've we yeah. had all these stats just weeks ago and like he's, he's so excited but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it, it is pretty i mean the chorus but the big thing of all chorus watches in between runs and they don't actually take heart rate readings mm. as often as some other watches but they basically don't move the battery life like it's quite scary because you go oh if I, you go into your your um your bedside cabinet all the watches you've been tested like a year later oh my god they're all still alive just like an old knock your phone there was one really weird anomaly though the ultra max mode which is like the lowest pulsing of the gps this is almost like your expedition mode burnt more than full gps burnt four percent Go odd. Figure. Very odd. Mm. odd. Interesting. Don't know. Don't know what I did. Don't know what I did there, but yeah. <laughs> and that video is coming out soon, isn't it, with the seven marathons in seven days? And I've just been editing all that together, yeah, so you'll be able to catch yeah. up with exactly how that went and see what I suffered in order to bring you those stats. We've also got Very a special soon. one just on the shoes, because you know, I like talking about shoes. There's only so much battery talk a man can have. Speaking of shoes, there's one just in the foreground that's also yes. been in the uh, lab yeah. at the moment, the, uh, the Bondi X. That's sort of in the in the beginnings of your testing at the moment. What are the kind of initial reactions kind of take out? You know, you know how earlier we were saying you can't just whack a high stack and a carbon plate and a shoe. <laughs> <laughs> just a big example, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so far, I've only done one run in it because I'm still recovering from London. I have been. <laughs> it's, it's such a big shoe. It's, it's yeah. pretty and, chunky, um, isn't it? And I, I, at the moment, my impression is still that the cheaper you go in Hawker's carbon range, the better the shoe. In that the carbon, the Rocket X is a very yeah. good shoe. And then mm-hmm. as you go up, this is 180 pounds. It's more expensive than the Carbon X2 as well. Um, and I, have, I haven't loved it for my first run, I have to say. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't used the previous uh, Bondi. I 
this point for that has nothing to do with the beach whatsoever. Um, right. <laughs> but I've used the Carbon X2, which there's, there's elements of the design in that. Um, I love the Rocket X. And I put this on, I did nine miles. And yes, I've probably been able to run further than these guys have had a, probably an a extra week of recovery. recovery. <laughs> um, and I just didn't get what I thought was get from the cushioning from it. And also, I didn't really get the kind of benefits or well, felt the benefits of the guy. I kind of don't understand what it's sort of aimed or who it's aimed for what kind of shoe it it's is everyone I guess it feels like for me like a, it's an e, like an easy mile shoe but I don't think it I think there's better oh, for me was, again it's just one run but I, mm. straight away I, I could think of some other shoes I think the Triumph that I we've been testing I feel like it's a really nice easy shoe and it's, it's, it's cheaper than this shoe and I think I don't know if the price is quite there and who it was really it 180? 180 yeah. pounds is a lot is you're paying for a plate that yeah. you don't really need or I found have not felt on the run yeah Tom likes it a little bit but yeah. more than us I so. often go on the record as loving quite heavily cushioned shoes <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why um, but yeah we discuss these quite a lot and I actually I, I'm, I'm injured at the moment so I've not done loads of miles in it uh, I did a park run in it on Saturday well, I liked it. It's not. It didn't blow me away. I certainly don't know why there's a plate in it. Mm. <laughs> I didn't feel the plate in any stretch of the imagination, and I don't think I'd ever use this for racing or anything like that. So, mm. I think there's a certain element of I'm talking about carbon plate shoes earlier. It's like just keep putting carbon plate shoes in all your shoes. It just yeah. seems unnecessary. You, you might, uh, and, and Hocker are probably one of the worst for doing this at the moment because we keep seeing carbon plate shoes come from them, and. None of them really seem that focused on the same sort of thing that like big flyers. It's mm. it's it, mm. none of them really have major ratios, and this is the, probably the the furthest away from that I think because it's you know it's a nice shoe, but 108 pounds for something that doesn't you need to carbon plate. It seems a bit strange. Can we talk about? How, I mean, we said it's big, but I'm not. Again, I think sort of Hoka. I, 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 really like it. It. <laughs> I really like the fact. In the early days, Hoka, yes, they had a high stack, but they weren't they weren't didn't have this kind of foam spilling over the sides and yes. the back and that big tail on it. Mm. You know, you, you clip it when you're walking down stairs, I think, anyway. It just feels more shoe than you really need. And that's the that's the first thing when you put it on, you go, that's a lot of shoe. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been reading about these tails. And boy, if you get a very small heel bevel, actually, on these Pumas, you might see actually just a little bit of raise. That is something that's they're starting to think might like, a transition for heel strikers and things like that. But actually... No one knows anything. That is purely for show, as far as I can tell. In terms of actual performance, I can't work out. everyone, all the, like, the testing seems to suggest that, oh, it's just that you want to basically have a signature look to your shoe. Because obviously, the Nikes got very popular with their little shark fin on the back, mm. and um, it became a bit of a thing. And Hocker had the you know the more outlandish ones, like the hiking boot that had that massive thing, and the Hocker Clifton yes. Edge, and now they're bringing it in. It's, I mean, if you like, if you like the look, Good luck to you. And they have to spill over a bit because the stack's getting higher and need more stability. It's another problem with these high stacks. I have seen a lot of people when we ran London. Um, I did see quite a lot of people in the Clifton Edge, which surprised me. Really? Because okay. I, 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 we tested that shoe and it's got a really big bit at the, mm. on the heel. It's, it's not as big as the trail one, the yeah. nine, but it's still quite noticeable. And um, I, I, think we, I think I thought it was fine. Not like a major issue. I had no idea why there was a bit of extra Quite a nice downhill, really wasn't it? But that was about it. Yeah, yeah I'm not, I don't tend to run down many downhills for that training. Um, but yeah, the, but I saw a lot of people in London wearing it, which I thought was quite interesting. Nice well, speaking of the of the collective marathon, so I count with yours, so there's 11, I think, between us. Like, have there been any products that you've been testing that have kind of come into their own sort of during the marathon? I know, Nick, you had a bit, you've had a bit of a find with your Apple Watch, right? There's an app that you found because you're, you're, you like to be precise with your pacing he's, he's right? also the king of hunting apple apple watch yeah i don't yeah. 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 i'm on all the forums, <laughs> all the forums. <laughs> um so i'm a bit of an apologist for the apple watches you know i think a lot of serious runners write it off and as you know it's completely fair to do that purely on battery life but i don't mind charging things every day um and i really like the experience you get with it outside of running so work outdoors is my main running app on the watch which is an incredible app it really does bring it up the Apple Watch to the standard of something like a Garmin for me. Um, mm. But I use an app called You Race or Your Race, depending on how you, uh, you why are you race? So Your Race is how I was thinking of it. Because I, I am ace. Um, I was using that in my mind. <laughs> but basically, it's a very simple app. It uses yours on screen, but it has a feature that I've been using on a Garmin uh, Connect, IQ, a Connect IQ field called Peter's Race Pacer, where when you know what is accurate in a race, it's certainly a big city race. It's never going to be able to handle the buildings. So what the both of these things allow you to do is when you go for a mile marker, you can look down and go, or I'll use in K, it's like, okay, so at 10K, it says 10.14K, uh, click lap, and it goes back to 10K. And all your average pace, your estimated finish time, all correct to the actual distance you run through on the thing. So your race is the first one, or a new race I found on the Apple Watch. It's a double tap. Um, and it worked really well for me in the marathon, I have to say. Um, 
I'm not correcting it every K because they're usually all right, actually. They're not far out each K, but every few K I go, oh, okay, there's nothing of a difference now that I think, um, you know, I want to change that. It's not like I'm using my watch late into a race, but in a marathon in particular, first half, basically I want to be not running too fast mm. and you need to know because you, you want to, if you're running on feel, you're going to be running too fast because it's going to feel really good. So you actually yeah, almost right. need those sort of more compensate markers. Compensate for the adrenaline almost. Exactly. So if the, but if you go, oh, the watch is wrong, I'm definitely not running too fast, I'll keep running. Actually, no, if I correct it, the watch is right now and it still says I'm running too fast, I need to back off a bit here. My estimated finish time is five minutes ahead of target time. Uh, so I really like that. And then when I blew up late in the race, the fact that the estimated finish time, I was looking at it going, oh, it still says it's not too bad here. And it kind of got me, woke me up again. The last two K I managed to run again. I got a time I'm you know, really happy with. I had a lovely day, really good day. Someone asked me to rate the race out of 10. It was seven out of 10, but yeah. And that kind of thing just helped. You know, you go, oh, my estimate finish time isn't too bad here. Maybe I'll pick it up a bit. And I really liked it. And I think being able to correct your distance is better than any GPS watch is ever going to be able to do in terms of actual accuracy. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. I suppose as well with those GPS black spots as well, to yeah. have that, that comfort of knowing you're kind of, when it, when it goes awry, the oh, pace yeah. is like jumping two minutes or going down like two minutes to have that accuracy must be quite yeah. comforting. Well. Never more smug than when you come out of a tunnel and go, everyone's going, oh no, okay. Oh dear. I just do that. I just Speaking of, of comfort, um, chafing and friction are, are very, very important things for a marathon. And you had a bit of a breakthrough on your seven marathons in seven days. I mean, this, right? is, this is a subject very close to my heart and, and other soft bits. Um, <laughs> but yeah, seven, you're going to do seven in seven. And I was using sort of normal Vaseline, great. And then the guys at Premax got in touch with this anti chafe balm, anti friction balm. Which has got loads of lovely stuff in, it, like tea tree, aloe vera. I was a bit skeptical at first. Tea tree makes you think. Yeah, oh, very, very, very risky. No, anyone to put that? Well, yeah, I, mean, I was, tiger bar, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was thinking, yeah. my, I didn't, you know, I, I basically put a little shout out before I didn't go running one morning and whack it all over. But it's, I'm a big Two Tom Sport Shield fan, which I would use in most races as my kind of reliable, you know, nips and bits rub. And uh, I didn't really very sort of stray from that. This actually was brilliant. I used it for the rest of the week. From like day three onwards, I used it for the rest of the week. It's um, It comes with a nice... I mean, I'm, you don't want to go too close to this. <laughs> so a, how would you got that? Angled up. Okay, so I, just, I squeezed it on, smeared it over. But the only problem is it's £14 a tube. How much is... How much is and oh, I used up oh, all of that tube pretty much in three okay. marathons. So it's pretty. it might be a little treat for race day rather than using it all the time. Two Tom's Sports Shield, by contrast, is about £13 for a roll-on. And that will last you a lot longer. Mm. But this did a brilliant job. Smells nice. Kept everything unchafed over seven days. Very good. And obviously with the marathon as well, you see a lot of the coverage on TV. Some people are running with, with music as yeah. well. And music quite uh, quite an important part for a lot of people in their training. I know you've been having a lot of praise for the, the JBL Reflect Flow. Like, did you yeah. wear those in, in Berlin? I did not, but I had been wearing it around. I kind of, when it comes to the race day, I kind of stick to what I... I'm familiar with, but uh, it's Nothing something that, yeah, but, it's very but I'm, I'm absolutely a kind of sucker for sports headphones. And if I find something that's really good, I mean, I'm happy to talk a lot about it. But JBL, so these are the JBL um, Reflect Flow Pro. So there's a Reflect Flow, these are Reflect Flow Pro. And the main mm -hmm. thing here it is, you've got active noise cancellation, you've got slightly different, um, slightly adapted fit, but ultimately it's about keeping it nice and secure. You're also getting better in terms of, the durability um, for kind of water and water, dust. Right, right, right. Um, you can technically swim with it, but ultimately it's Bluetooth headphones and you're not going to get much use out of them uh, in the water. So, um, but I ultimately I, I found they kind of sit at 150, 160 pounds. So they're sitting against things like the Jaybird Vista 2, um, which we're all kind of big fans of, the Jabra Elite Active 75T as well. Uh, and generally, literally I, I put them on first run. I've just found this, the fit really strong. The sound I found really good as well. Very kind of versatile in terms of different music. I don't listen to any EDM. Uh, <laughs> everything else, it works for great. <laughs> have, you heard, there, have, so. have you heard the verbs lucky man? <laughs> 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 yeah. it's the sound of the summer. Uh, yeah. um, but I, I, one thing I, I'm always a lot of these a lot of these headphones are starting to bring in an active noise cancellation, which has always been a very premium feature for a lot of headphones, and now they're finding themselves in sport headphones. Now it's not perfect. I find out in kind of kind of out in roads that you know in terms of dampening the sound of wind it's not 100 percent there i've actually found with traffic is actually it works a little bit better from mm. that from that point of view and um, so i think actually it's worked really well in comparison to the other devices that have those headphones that have this it's worked really well in comparison mm -hmm. to those uh, and the battery life is really strong as well so you're getting 10 hours 
And without ANC or active noise cancellation, then it kind of drops down to eight. But in all my kind of runs that I've used, there hasn't been a worrying kind of drop off that you can okay. kind of time C. Um, and I think at that price point, I think it's a really strong option. One that um, I've kind of really enjoyed using. Right, some highlights there from, yeah. from some of your testing. So I suppose this feels like a, a time to sort of throw it out to the people watching. Like, have we have we had any questions? <laughs> so, well, we've actually had somebody raise uh, the point that I don't did we, at the start. Did we say? You can raise questions. We did, yeah. We did? Yes, okay, we did. so probably reiterate that now. <laughs> if you've had any questions. Uh, but if you have got questions about any of these products or anything else, just put them in the comments and we'll address them at some point in this video. Gives me a moment to moan about the Fitbit charge. I'll be okay with Fitbit in the past. It's obviously aimed at a slightly different consumer than us, but I found this latest one has gone backwards in that the GPS doesn't work. Um, and I wanted to raise that quickly. And yeah, but you've been testing it, Mike, as well. You, I found that GPS and heart rate both were very dodgy on this. And I think it's actually mm. a potential fundamental hardware problem here. So if you're a runner, it might be uh, one to Yeah, so I I actually, I use this for uh, Berlin Marathon. Um, okay. So I've marathon tested it. And I thought I'd marathon tested it properly, but ultimately the GPS didn't lock on as I thought it had done. So I didn't get a after it, so it, it kind of moved to, it's meant to move to kind of a smart GPS mode. It didn't do that kind of relying on the accelerometer, the motion sensors, which are generally going to be less accurate than GPS, obviously. So it clocked me at 38K instead of 42 you Jumped off the course. Device. You I did. I did. No, no, no. Absolutely. I always have my main watch. So okay. Yeah, okay. I'll okay. check something. Did that, that weigh you down a little bit? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe that's what caused the cramp. Um, <laughs> but actually, interesting enough, I, I found the heart rate monitoring actually very accurate. So it's weird. The GPS is really bad for me, but the heart rate, I think there's there's a weird, there's there's talk of a weird quirk of if you have the the band on too tight. So you get good HR. You get good HR, but bad GPS. And, <laughs> the other, and then vice versa, kind of in terms of, yeah. which is, is amazing to think that's kind of got through as a, as a battle. Now I know you know with, with Fitbit, it's, not everything is, is running focused, but it does put mm. those features on there and things like, daily readiness score which is something they've introduced and is not um, available on that yeah. device yet it's kind of driven to help you decide whether you should train and whether you not so if that information that's pulling through isn't really kind of accurate or it's not reliable yeah. it up ultimately it's, it's flawed so. price up on this as well 170 pounds yeah. that's the price of a very very good sports watch yeah. you're getting the your chorus page to the Garmin for uh, the Garmin 455 now I know it's not aimed at runners but yeah. I'm going to say unless you are basically someone who just wants a duration mm. and heart rate from a run uh, you, you might get better heart rate than me mm. This won't work for us. So, take a start so even, yeah. if you're, your pulse. even if you're a very casual runner, this yeah. I just don't think. I, if you're someone who goes, oh, I only log two five k, yeah, you want you want to you know, know you run five k and not. You want to work, that, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think it's a step because I think the Charge Four had better GPS actually. One hundred thirty pounds as well. And obviously you're pay, uh, paying a little bit more in terms of the fact that it's got a color screen, it's got ECG, which is not going to yeah. uh, a sense is not going to be for everyone. And some other health monitoring features, but ultimately from a, a running. Mm -hmm. Kind of focus perspective, it's it's not quite yeah. delivering mm -hmm. um, from activity. Get yourself a withings. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> get yourself a withings. Also, <laughs> also huge bugbear. Uh, don't trail a massive new feature, then don't have it on the watch at launch because you're asking people to spend full price on a watch that doesn't have the feature yet with no time scale when it's coming. And that's that goes across every company. There's a few yeah. that are guilty of that, and I um I really hate it <laughs> uh, because yeah, you're you, you're set, you're selling it as if it's ready, and you promised a feature that isn't there, and you haven't given a timeline, and I think that's not on. Mm. Well, we were touching on one set of headphones, and I forgot to mention yeah, these yeah. rather these rather snazzy sort of see through nothing headphones. They've also been in the lab testing as well. How have you been getting? On yeah, with those? So, so I guess these these are called the Nothing One earbuds, and I guess their real kind of place is almost like a cheaper alternative to your Apple AirPods Pro. That's really where they're pitched. They've got mm. kind of a similar design with the sort of stems that come down out of, out of your ears. Um, and I, we've sort of wanted to see if they were any good for runners. So I've tested those again whilst I was doing these marathons. And I think they're actually really surprisingly good. You know, fit, I found, personally, I don't have problems with them falling out in terms of those kind of in-ears. But because they're so light, there's not much weight in the body. They don't shake themselves loose. They feel so light in the ears. They fit really nicely. They're about 4.7 grams. Um, and the, the sound, I thought, was really, really cracking on these. So you put them in, it's a really sort of full-bodied... Lucky man. Lucky man. Out. <laughs> 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 Just filling my ears with lucky man. Have you had yeah. a song called lucky man? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I, so I, I was really kind of surprised. They're, they're £99. Yeah. So when you put them up okay. against some of the others, you know, you're going to pay like 170 180 or even higher for some of these. You're going to get five hours runtime, and that is how it held up. They lasted me a four-and-a-half-hour marathon. 
Uh, you're going to get a further 29 in the case. So you've got kind of 34 hours overall. The case isn't particularly portable, um, but it is beautiful. So I, think I like that sort of stripped back minimalist kind of design. I One criticism, they do not have L and R written on them. And I, and I can't oh. work out oh, often mate. which is the book. <laughs> which is the book. Oh, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, you know, it's a small thing. I'm tired. I'm tired. So all of your marathons are seven days. You not didn't all know of them. Right, it doesn't really matter. You've worked it out. Just write it off. Anyway, for for ninety nine quid, you know, if the fit works for you on these, I think they're a really good option to look at. Yeah, I can tell they won't work for me because I have problems with that exact kind of fit. But I'm in the minority, I think. So, and I think these would make a cracking Christmas present. For too early to talk about Christmas. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry, confused. Confused. (laughs) Hold up, Kieran. Open his headphones. Just put him in the wrong. Take him off. Get him a glass of sherry. Last Kieran wrote something his left from his right. Is that that interesting? Yeah. yeah. Many questions come through. uh, We have some questions actually. Oh, good. So we've got um, uh, from Weho. uh, We've got any advice on bone conduction headphones? Ooh. Good question. We get that a lot. Yeah. I think one thing that's interesting with them is that you guys test it. Is it's not just aftershocks, is it? Yeah. So actually, surprisingly, I have tested a lot of different not like non aftershocks uh, bone conduction headphones, and I was very skeptical about these. I mean, you've tested some as well. I think I have a few things. Actually, in terms of the experience, the sound quality, kind of a bit about the durability, because you, you know, there's a lot of these um, device um, headphones out on Amazon that are very cheap. But actually, there's ones that I've I've tested and I I still use um, that I that, that are available on Amazon and actually worked really really well. So I've used the uh, Nyanka Runner Pro, yeah. uh, which has a built-in music player. Now you can get that uh, a model on the after uh, the Aftershocks range that has that, but it's more expensive. Um, this one's also waterproof and I swim a lot, so it's been perfect uh, for that. Um, but there's uh, Vidon is yeah. a is a, a brand that you've tested. I've tested those as well. And those are really strong and they're cheaper than, you know, than what Aftershocks um, mm. cost. And I think, yeah, that's the important thing here is that there are other options outside of mm. what Aftershocks get. And I know people have had experiences, mm. uh, bad experiences with Aftershocks. I've had bad experiences with them as well. So they're not, you know, faultless well, in that sense. I'll definitely say across bone conduction headphones, check, make sure you've got a good warranty. I actually yes. haven't broken any bone conduction headphones yeah. ever, despite being quite loose with them. You guys have both had problems. Yeah. We see a lot. We get comments on that a lot. Not just, you know, there's no yeah. specific brand. It's like, so yeah, make sure you're getting good warranty on bone conduction. It seems to be a slightly more... And I guess there's bone conduction, there's also open ears. So there's a, Bose have got a new product. Uh, yeah. reach for the name in my head, but they've, yeah. it's only available in the US at the moment. But you're, you're seeing other technology coming that basically leaves your ears yeah. open. We right? have the uh, sunglasses. And the, the Bose sunglasses. Yeah. 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 And the Bose sunglasses sound really good, actually. Um, for a speaker, just, it's just near the year. Yeah. Um, there's also a band called the Moo Ring, uh, yeah. MU Ring, which, which I tried recently. does not work with glasses, yeah. uh, so I can't use it because I wear I mean, glasses. Well, it's like, a, it's like a headband or something. Yeah, it doesn't go around the front. Well, I know. Well, there's a nice synergy for you. Yeah, it just goes here, but it's from it comes down, it has to sit on the cheek so well. Well, that it, I wear, I often wear prescription sunglasses to run, and um, I couldn't use it with that. And I think it gets in the way of hats even a little I, bit. I tested those, and they're essentially putting speakers near to your ears, and I would not say they're better quality sound compared to no. the bone conduction headphones that I've okay. tested. And they just make you look odd as well, I well, think. Well, it's good to know that there's quite a lot of other options out there when yeah. it comes to bone conducting kind of technology. Any, any other questions that have jumped out for you? Well, before uh, we go to questions, I would say the other thing with bone conduction ah. headphones is you have to be wary of the sound because a lot of the ones I've tested don't have, they don't go as loud mm. as, as oh, in yeah. a headphone. So if you like podcasts or audiobooks, it, I have them struggle quite a lot because yeah. I listen to podcasts and audiobooks a lot. And if you're running and it's a bit windy or something, don't listen yeah. to this so podcast. Your, your <laughs> Don't you dare. Go, go for some proper studio headphones. Right. Any, any other questions that yeah, jumped up? More questions. Yeah. What's, um, this is very good, actually, from Sebastian Scheel. Uh, what's your favourite cap for running? Um, oh. He's got another question, but we'll answer that one first. Ooh. We can rattle through. My, my actual favourite is the Ifley Road Putney cap. Just I've uh, had some good memories in that hat. Very, And it's, uh, it's, a, it's not a running style one. It's a bit more full. Oh, it's difficult for me because I've just got a, I got given a free one by Hoka <laughs> that you can't actually buy. I, I, I literally run oh, almost every day in that. Yeah, I also I've got an on running cap that I'll wear. That's a good cap. Yeah. Mm, okay. I have got a lot of hats. I like my caps, but actually in races I don't generally wear them. But for training, um, I generally use the Sky. I never know say Sayski or Sayski. Sky. They're kind of the Copen, uh, from Copenhagen. Yeah, right? yeah. So they they're kind of um, they're reversible cap, which actually is really soft. It's easy. If I take it and I get sweaty, I can actually put it into my um, into my running belt as well. I find it really nice and comfortable to wear, and actually 
it offers a nice enough kind of protection. So it's not too heavy and big uh, nice. for me. Okay. So, yeah. Nice, nice. And obviously there's the uh, the run testers well, official cap. Really, <laughs> that makes uh, you faster, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it just gets you a lot of you know respect. <laughs> I mean, this is actually the only one that exists. In the I world, don't have one. So, yeah, yeah. Ooh, no, none of us have one. So you yeah. talk. Oh my God. Um, I would say caps uh, the on running cap for me. Mm. But I've recently started wearing the uh, buff cap, which is called five panel cap or something. Um, well, that's great as well because you can actually bend that one thing about the on one is that you can't really crumple it in your bag because yeah. it break the, the, the front but the buff one still keeps its shape but you can scrumple it in your bag and i i mean you finish your race stuff your cap into your bag and then you get home oh, and you're like, well, nice. i can't use this again because it's all over the place yeah. so, so was the, some... what was the second part of his question well it's not related to that it's another <laughs> it's basically a completely different question <laughs> yeah. uh, but we'll do it quickly we'll do this uh, quickly and then we'll, then we'll wrap uh, it up any out. recommendations for long tights with phone pockets in very pertinent questions uh, uh, yeah. see I'm not a huge tights wearer so I might mm. pass this on but this is something that I do I do like a phone pocket though I, I mean, I'm a short shorts man. We never like even in the even in the cold even in the cold weather. So um, you basically just wear briefs. Then. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I tell you what, I I don't really wear. I mean, if it depends if you're if you're someone who just likes to wear tights and no shorts over the top. Mm. It's a controversial subject. I'm a shorts over the top of my tights. I for carrying my phone and stuff, I'd always go for a mass storage short. Yeah, like a high storage short, and that is something we're going to be doing on the channel God, later on. Them, so. Yeah. We might have a solution for you that's not tight space. I have tested one. Uh, I, I have just tried some Yuffie Road tights to have a decent pocket on the back. I know there's a comp, uh, Zone 3, uh, but they're more basic triathlons. They've yes. got some tights that do have a side pocket. Mm -hmm. It's certainly something that I'd like to see more of. It does seem to be better, actually, on the women's side of things, like Lululemon. Yeah, actually, Lululemon yeah, probably yeah, do yeah. some good tights for that. Um, but I've not seen a really good, va uh, good value option on this front yet. But yeah. I have seen some very good value... High storage shorts. Oh, God, we're going to talk so much about high storage shorts. <laughs> 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 that, that might be, that might be a, an item on next month's episode. <laughs> the whole episode. Well, th thank you so much for, for sending in all of those questions. We're going to dive into a few more on the podcast episode, which will be being released next week. We're going to have a bit, a bit of a deeper dive into some of the stuff that we've been talking about today. But I think thank you so much to, to everyone for, for tuning in. Thanks to you guys for doing all your... Uh, fantastic testing well don't forget the saw competition is is now live so the link i think has it been posted in yes, the chat it's in the chat yeah so if you want to head over to there to find out more details about how you can get your hands on this latest saw jacket and uh thanks very much and we'll we'll see you this time next month anything from you guys before we close it out no no it's <laughs> <laughs> one of my products which I ran the marathon in, a Fitletic uh, Bolt 2 pocket running belt. I love running belts. These guys all choose really com confusing tech to talk about. I just like a belt. Really. <laughs> <laughs> That's the job. Two pockets, done. <laughs> and on that bombshell, we'll leave you. Thank you so much for joining us for, for Different Gear Live, and we'll see you this time next month. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Awkward wave. Are we off? Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs>